Thank you, Judy, for that welcome. And thank you to WinZero for the invitation to speak today. And it is a pleasure to be with you. I'm very interested, having been in local government in my earlier incarnation, I had spent 14 years in local government in Kiama. And at that time, there were enormous number of public meetings on all major issues. But of recent years, that seems to have disappeared and we're, we're into our internet trenches and social media trenches and we throw rocks at one another and we don't have intelligent open dialogue with one another in testing ideas in a forum like this. So I'm hoping today does provide some stimulation from what we might say and then an open and interrogating discussion about some of these ideas. Now firstly I'd Topic today, from cars to community, rethinking planning. Our urban form that we've been following in the last 70 years or so, the conventional sprawl on the edge of town, has contributed heavily to these crises that we're currently facing. All these crises may not affect you personally, but they're affecting society right across the board. And a prime cause has been the type of urban development that we've been rolling out in the last 70 years. We now know that conventional sprawl subdivision is by far the most expensive way to house people in human history. The houses are getting bigger. The infrastructure is on a longer and longer line out to the edge. And the state government recently said last year, for every house that goes out on the edge, there's $75,000. Um, taxes in addition that the government have to pay for an infrastructure that's not paid for by that development. In Australia, we now have the largest average house size in the world for a new build. They're 240 metres and we've just pipped America. We're just past. In 1960, the average house size was 20 metres, average new build, and there were 3.6 persons per household. Today, it's 240 metres, and there are 2.4 persons per household. So if you do the math, three times more floor space is needed per person to house a person today, and we wonder why housing is so expensive for our youngsters. The other problem with the urban sprawl, and it's going to catch up on us, all the development we've done like this, is as the infrastructure degrades over time, Local councils are going to have to foot the bill for rebuilding and repairing that aging infrastructure. And I've read a number of articles about how this is impacting severely and even bankrupting some municipal governments in the US when they're now facing these huge bills to go out and rebuild these old roads and older in a very low density setting. On a personal level, it's extremely impactful on our household budgets. The latest figures I've seen that in Australia, the average household budget, 17% of the household budget is going in transit costs. Now, I think we can do better than this. Problem is that we've been laying regulation on regulation and we now have a great pile of government agencies all with their regulations, over 1,100 pages of regulation if you're going to do a development like this. Problem is, if you try to do something different from this, it's almost impossible. If you try to step outside the square because the compliance requirements are so strict, this is the easiest thing to do, the fastest thing to do, and if you try and step outside the square, and I can tell you we've been in that space, and it's very hard if you try to do something perceived to be better, something more diverse. Now, the other out outcomes for conventional development, we, have, we now know that we have very poor health outcomes, challenges to the household budgets, which I've talked about, sedentary lifestyles, poor physical health, obesity, poor mental health, social isolation and loneliness. If you imagine if you're in a sprawl suburb, car dependent for every need, and you don't have a license, or a youngster who doesn't have a license. You've got challenges 
And it's not a high quality of life when you've got to wait for your parents or someone to drive you somewhere. Car dependent for every need. This came in the 50s. Car companies were behind it and they actually drove an approach to urban development with cul-de-sacs turning back on one another, no direct routes, made public transit almost impossible. And they succeeded. And we swallowed it and we're rolling it out now, continuing to roll it out. Just have a look at the, the physical layout of the roads in East Barrel. You'll see that model, which we swallowed in the 1950s and 60s here in Australia. One of the other big challenges or, or consequences of urban sprawl is the lack of diversity of housing. These are large, single, freestanding homes, and we're missing out on providing homes for singles. 25% of houses in New South Wales have one person in them. Why do they need a big house to rattle around in? What's the cost of that to society and to individuals? We need double singles. Society is quite different today. Double singles, studios. We need to provide for renters, for service workers, for first home buyers, for downsizers. Research in Melbourne said, came up, 50% of people over 65 would downsize if there was a suitable product available for them. But that uh, the range of product is simply not there. Live work dwellings, shops, multi-generational, uh, shop top housing, laneway housing, and multi-generational housing. These are, these are cho the broad spectrum of choices that society is looking at depending on your life stage and lifestyle. So why are we sleepwalking into these crises? Why have we been doing this? Well, the political risk inherent in change of planning systems is well known. And you've only got to talk to people who've been a planning minister, and I've spoken to a few, and they're very nervous about the pushback from the community for any change. And the general feeling is that it's going to water down standards. There is a lack in Australia of good quality models for the public to experience and to try and emulate. There is development industry resistance to change, especially the majors who are quite happy with their systemized production of housing. They roll it out there. All their consultants know what to do. Their bankers know what to do. They've got major housing companies that come in and buy the land or buy a hundred on this estate and a hundred on the next one. You know, I've spoken to a few executives in the big industry developers, and they've said, we can sell, we can build, we know what we're doing, the system's there, we can sell everything we want, why do we have to put effort into change? And so this is a, a bit of a trauma that we have in trying to get that change. Public objections to density. We do need density and we need diversity, but we have public objections and largely, I think the public are uncertain about the density that they're going to get. And there's a lack of chance for informed public discourse, such as I'm hoping the, the, the discourse we might have later today about this. And there's clearly widespread discontent with the current development examples. So urban expansion in our shire, the state government is driving development targets on every local government in New South Wales. And if the local government doesn't perform, the minister will come over the top and zone land, whether the community likes it or not, just to meet these templates. And that happened here in Mossvale. They felt this, the count, local council of the day was going too slow on this, and they came in and just zoned it. And all of the issues relating to infrastructure and challenges, to the roads, stormwater and sewer hadn't been fully resolved. But that didn't stop the state government coming in and said, we've got growth targets and we've got to meet them. So my view is unless we really look at this issue ourselves and get on the front foot, it's going to be done for us again, and it's being done in other districts. If we don't change, we'll continue this model. We know we've got a flawed model, but we'll continue just to try and do that better. So doing the wrong thing better is basically what we've been doing for the last few decades. What has been missing is the segment of housing Especially in regional Australia, this is a big challenge. There's not enough diversity of housing for our service workers, for example. You've only got to go and sit in 
and the main street of Mittagong and watch the armada of vehicles that come in from the north, commuting in from the north, all those service workers, they have not got local housing suitable for them, that's affordable, and basically smaller means more affordable. So that's one of the flaws in our district. Now, if you look at the state figures here, across the state, the average is 35% of all dwellings are other than freestanding homes. In the Southern Highlands, 9% of housing is other than freestanding. So we've really got a tragic shortfall of diverse housing choice. And the people who are affected by that aren't here today. They're out working in our hospitals, police stations, there are service workers in retail, in our councils and what have you. These are the people who are on modest salaries, they're keeping our community going, and they're not here today. And my daughter often refers to them as the voiceless ones in this debate. And we're not, we haven't been caring for them properly. I want to talk about now the power of nearness. Because in small subdivisions, you're spread out, further out, more housing, further out you go. And you've all noticed the real estate advertising, after they describe the product that's being sold, they then start to tell you it's close to this, it's proximity to that, it's close to schools, it's only a few hundred metres to this and that. We see that constantly in the advertising. And that's because we like to be near things. And yet our urban form that we've been rolling out it puts us way out on the edge. Now our family company are involved with one landowner down the coast. David is here today. He authorised us to use this plan. We've been working on this plan with him. And this is an example of a new township that incorporates all of the best principles. And I, I wanted to show you this so I can go through the principles so you can better understand. So this is the, I'll just go through these. Now here is the, this is the town center. This circle at, from the town center out to the edge is 400 meters. We know that people will walk comfortably and routinely 400 meters. Between 400 and 500 metres, they start getting into their cars, and 600 metres away, they'll tend to get in their car and to drive downtown. So the, the target is for an optimum outcome to create a great place for people is to have about 60% of the residents within a 400 metre walking distance of a traditional town centre. That would be, in this plan, that's an IGA. This is the main street. There's common parking, three common parking spaces, and common parking is twice as efficient as private parking. So you make sure that all of the commercial premises don't have their own car parking, because half the time that might be empty where they're out. You spend your money on having common car parking, and you only need to provide half as much, and it's much more efficient, and you're able to maintain the compactness of these places. This area here we've planned is for a diverse range of commercial uses. It might be everything from a medical practice to small businesses. And this is a little employment centre that provides services. This is going to is planned for about 1,500 dwellings. That's about 3,800 people, roughly. That's the, the scale of this. And if you can think of Jeringong, Jaroa, Weary Beach, if you put all of those urban areas together, that's about 4,100. So that'll give you this idea of the scale of this project. And you need over 3,000 people to drive the economics of the town centre. The other uses, this is medium density, the darker pink, and we have rear lanes servicing all of those because rear lanes permit you to do terrace homes, for example. Premier recently talked about having more terrace homes in Sydney you can't do terrace homes unless you've got a rear lane and it's in, almost impossible to retrofit a rear lane in an existing urban area. So all of the medium density here is planned to have rear lanes. These might be three-storey walk-ups, just a couple in here. And this area, this pink colour here is conventional freestanding dwellings. This is a hotel over here with about 60 tourist cabins. 
There is a primary school plan next door by the authorities that's currently zoned up at this level. We have a preschool and early childhood education here. And this is Knob Hill. Like every country town, there's a, a little patch where the, uh, the more affluent folks live and like to go and, and bring their skills and affluence and creativity and business development. And professionals live here. So the, the concept is you provide for all segments of society. Uh, this was an image we did of Tullamba. Now, we, uh, just quickly on Tullamba, we started on that project. We just bought our partner out. We'd bought all the infrastructure in. We built the roads and services in and built the third, first 30 houses as a demonstration on the main street and the GFC hit. And we were at peak financial exposure and our finance facility rolled and the bank said, please give us our money back. You couldn't finance a reasonable project in regional New South Wales for three years. That company went into default and we limped along and developed a bit more with the bank. And then finally they said sell. Before we could finish the town centre, we were forced to sell in the end to other parties. And these things happen, but that was just exquisitely bad timing on our part, and we were unable to deliver that. But there are some elements here which I'll show you in a moment. So this is the main street leading into Tullambar. These trees are only 17 years old, but selecting tr uh, trees in, this, in, uh, in a street is such an important element to the design of streets. They have to have scale. If they're large enough, they will shelter the pedestrians. Very dense shade. We've used deciduous trees because they have dense shade in summer and they're deciduous in winter and allow winter access. The road here, all roads in Tullambar were designed to a 40 kilometer, kilometer speed limit by narrowing them down and the drivers naturally are more cautious in a narrower street. Some drivers don't like this, but I can tell you that the residents do like it. And that's the key. The key to designing these places is to have regard for the amenity of the residents that's what counts, not racing cars through quickly and a car never having to wait at an intersection. This is nonsense. These are places where urbanized homo sapiens want to have a lovely ecosystem to live in. And places where cars rush round are really not conducive. And getting the municipal engineers to think this way is quite a challenge, I have to say. We wrote our own development control plan there because we realised the current regulatory framework does not permit this to be done. We worked with one council planner and a, a consultant lady we had from Melbourne. She was Oxford Masters. And we wrote the DCP and only one metre front setback. We mandated a veranda on the front of every house and the footpath hard up against the private property boundary. So people walking past someone sitting on the veranda were only two or three metres apart, and you are bound by social convention to say good day. And, you know, we are social beings. We really lo like engagement. And you can either design that opportunity out, as we do in Sprawl, or you can design it in if you have a traditional township like this. This house is only about 16 years old, and there's nothing frightening. They're only on 300 metre blocks. And the people who've lived here came from sprawl settings. And my goodness, they say they've never enjoyed uh, a living setting better, even though we didn't get to build the prime thing, which was the town centre, tipped out before we were able to do that. This one shows the diversity. This is a rear lane. We've got houses sitting above three garages, one for the house above and two garages for the house at the front. And these are extremely popular in this laneway housing for midlife singles. I think it was a, a lot of them were divorced. And they were extremely popular. We were staggered by the, how quickly they sold. Next one on the top, that product was very popular with the 65 year olds. The one at the bottom here was a multi-generational house. We designed that for a lady and her family and her elderly mother was living out the back. So the message I wanted to leave with you here is that we can positively design for the housing needs of the full spectrum of society. 
and still have it looking reasonably good. We must consider that we're designing people, not just cars, and that's where we've come from. The target to develop a compact, diverse, walkable, mixed-use township. Traditional town centres are places where we exchange things. We exchange ideas, information, we get goods and services, we exchange sympathy and inspiration, we exchange ideas. When they are well designed, they are places where casual social connections will naturally occur. And that adds social and cultural vibrancy to our lives. I just wanted to show you this little picture. This is the general store in Jamboree. Burnt down about 15 years ago, and about 12 years ago, they rebuilt it faithfully. And all it is is this is just a facade. Behind this is just a tin shed. This is the focal point of the town. It's grosser, and people love and admire this building, even though it's only 12 years old. So we can really acknowledge our heritage quite well, even today. So I thought that was just a good example. The key to getting a township so it's walkable is to have local goods and services, primarily a grocer of about a thousand metre floor space, which is large enough to provide your weekly needs at competitive prices. So I always associate urban sprawl with fast food. It's easy and convenient, but it's not necessarily good for you. And for developers, it's easy and convenient to subdivide and develop this and the housing industry, the builders are accustomed to doing this stuff. They have their systems. It's not necessarily good for society. So what are the indispensable factors in designing new, a, a new urban area? Access to weekly grocery needs in a traditional main street. I think that's fundamental. If you don't get that right, people are getting into their cars and driving and you've got car dependence. So that's got to be fundamental. And to get that, you need between 3,000 and 6,000 residents. A grid street pattern, that's the traditional approach like a barrel, for example, footpaths on both sides of every street. At Tullambar, we did that voluntarily. We weren't required under our DA to do this, but we did it. Diverse housing to suit all lifestyles and stages. And public transit from the centre. We know public transit doesn't work in sprawl. It's just not economic. But it does work from the centre of a compact new township. I want you to look at this. This is an interesting number I got. Professor Chris Leinberg is one of the leading urban economists in the US. Average household in the US spends 19% of their budget on transit. Those families who live on the edge of a large city in a sprawl setting, 24% of their household budget is in transit costs. And if you're in a compact township, Main Street retail, diverse housing, and the local jobs that go with that, 9% average. And by the way, the new compact township movement in the US is quite a mature industry. And it's a mystery to me why we haven't taken it on here. So in the US, following the GFC, where urban sprawl collapsed in value and the new compact townships that had been built, the values held up, caused a major rethink in the American market. And now is a very widespread focus on developing walkable communities. It's much easier, apparently, in the US now, in most jurisdictions, to get planning permits for walkable urban development. The big challenge that we have hit there as here is the existing regulatory settings and single-use zones. That's a big impediment to what I've been talking about. On an environmental side, moving from drivable to walkable can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 80%. This is startling. And we think all we have to do is put photovoltaics on our roof. She'll be right, mate. Well, the combination of our transit emissions and our building emissions far exceed cost of electricity and heat emissions. So this is a big arena where we as individuals and as a community can make great strides. 
and don't lock in the worst urban structure. Because you put down a public road in the wrong place, you can bet it'll be there for a few centuries. The greatest power in our society is the surveyor's peak. And it's very hard to change things. So what are the challenges? Firstly, I think there's a general lack of awareness of what the positive alternatives to sprawl might be. Public approaches largely, we just want to stop development. We don't like it, so we want to stop it. Industry resistance to change, and I've spoken about that. And you hear these, the majors say, we've got a master plan. Oh, it's going to be all right. But it's a master plan of car-dependent urbanism. That's all it is. A bit of greenwash and a bit of pinkwash sometimes. We have limited opportunity to experience a model new towns in Australia. Current regulations are a real problem and the reticence to change regulations. And that's, we're finding that reticence at council and political level because of the risk associated. And really there's a challenge for everyone. If you step into this arena, because of the complexity, we have to turn up the dial on design to get the right outcomes. If we try to deliver best practice in the current regulatory framework, we're just not going to make the progress we could and we get fatigued very quickly. So what are the solutions for delivery of new towns? Now, th these are the procedural approaches that I see. A zoning template with one zone for the whole township. We had that at Tullambar. It was very fortunate we had that. And then a development control plan incorporates all the best principles in the objectives. If you have the objectives in a development control plan, then the master plan that's developed subsequently has to meet those objectives. So I see that as the approach. And then I see, and the developers may not like me for this, we need a voluntary planning agreement, or I might refer to it as involuntary, because you don't get a zoning unless you sign up and commit to adherence to the master plan that's incorporating all of these principles. Heard Judy talk about NIMBY, QUIMBY, and YIMBY. I think we've moved away from the banana stage, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. We understand now that we do need quality and density because the public are really fearful of density because of what, what they've seen in the past. But it is possible if they did it in the past well, don't forget on weekends, where do we go? We go to the berries and the barrels and the braidwoods. And we love that traditional architecture. We don't rush to Campbelltown sprawl suburbs on weekends. That's the modern version. But look what they did in the past. It was all developed about beauty and classical form and classical principles. So we need to raise the bar and turn up the dial on development. We need to emphasize the need for high design quality in urban development. And council responsibility, they have the primary responsibility for poor urban design, falls on the regulations and council's approval processes. Now, that's to me, that's the biggest single challenge. And we need motivated councils, and there are very few of them in Australia, I have to say, who are really taking the high-risk area. If we look at the Barrel South area, I've seen the urban design principles that have been developed for South Barrel, I want to congratulate the Windsor Caribbean Council. I've used my network around Australia to see what other councils are doing this and have adopted these principles. And the answer is no one. In fact, we have not developed a quality new township that's really a lovely place to live and a place you would want to visit. We haven't done that in a hundred years in Australia. With the principles that council are now looking at adopting formally, they've been produced by their consultants. I think South Barrel has the chance of producing one of the most important new urban areas in Australia. And my personal wish is to ask the community to stay open-minded about this and be involved in productive discussions about this because it's a wonderful opportunity when the local council has initiated this. And finally, the well-being of every individual, each one of us is inextricably bound up in the well-being of society as a whole. 
too long we've been looking at urban design just from the point of our individual feeling and not thinking about others. And the stress that's out in the community at the moment through our failure in this district to deliver diverse housing choice, and that actually comes back primarily to creating smaller product. And it's remarkable how things could change if we do that. So I'm trying to get everyone to think more com about our obligation to society as a whole and to each other. Because the voiceless ones who are suffering this aren't here today. And finally, today, I hope I've sparked your interest in this topic and I'm taking you, I've taken you effectively on the journey, the urban journey from I to we. Thank you, Sam.